Good morning. It's good to see some friendly faces here. Welcome to the fifth annual academic convocation. I'm Rick Muma, Executive Vice President and Provost, and would like to extend a warm shocker welcome to our students, our faculty and staff, and all community members who are joining us in person and online. President Golden wishes he could be here today, but he is attending a meeting at the Kansas Board of Regents, so he has recorded a message for everyone this morning. Please take a look at the screen. Hello everyone, kind of the sign of the times we're in. I'm welcoming you to a new academic year here at Wichita State University. Although this is gonna be an academic year unlike any other that we've experienced, I'm very excited for what our future holds. So far, the beginning of the academic year has been off to a great start. Our students, faculty and staff have been wearing their masks, social distancing. I was just looking outside my window as choir was practicing, all wearing their masks, social distancing, and taking advantage of the beautiful campus and day we're having today. And I think that's what epitomizes our university, our faculty and our students and our staff. Well, we're all becoming even more innovative this year as we try to ensure a great academic and student experience. And that's gonna be challenging, but we're gonna get through it. I really appreciate all the hard work that each and every one of you are doing this year. And anything I can do as president, please reach out, because that's what I'm here for. There are gonna be some really exciting news coming out, and we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So there's lots to look forward to, and I look forward to sharing all those experiences and triumphs, and sometimes some of the issues that we're gonna be facing, but we're gonna do it together as a university, as a campus family. And as always, go Shocks. Thank you, Dr. Golden. Academic Convocation is an event that is meant to bring our learning community together to celebrate a new academic year and to tie into the ideas and themes from the WSU Common Read program. This year's book, Some Were Poppers, Some Were Kings, Dispatches from Kansas by Mark McCormick, is being used in a number of classes this year and serves as a foundation for a collection of programs that will unfold over the upcoming months. Some Were Poppers and Some Were Kings is a collection of columns from the Wichita Eagle written by Mark McCormick. And one thing I notice about the book is how relevant many of the columns are to what we are dealing with today in terms of COVID and other important issues in our country. We are honored and excited to have Mr. McCormick with us today. But before we get to our speaker for today's program, I'd like to recognize some of our outstanding faculty as we do each year for setting the standard for teaching and research activities at Wichita State. On the screen, you will see the names of our faculty members who were honored at the 2020 Faculty Awards last spring. And the winners are Angela Beeler, Young Faculty Risk Taker, Heidi Van Ravenhorse Bell, Young Faculty Scholar, Karen Countryman Rossworm, Excellence in Community Research, Darren Dufresne, Excellence in Accessibility, Rocio Del Aguilar, Young Faculty Risk Taker, John Dreifert, Leadership in the Advancement of Teaching, and Jason Heron, also Leadership in the Advancement of Teaching. Wang Yang Kim, Faculty Risk Taker, Roy Miosi, Excellence in Teaching, John Perry, Excellence in Online Teaching, Alex Schwarzberg, Excellence in Research, and Michelle Wallace, Academy for Effective Teaching. Thank you for all of your work in helping strengthen our learning community. The Wichita State community has always had deep ties to our larger Wichita community. This year, as we celebrate our 125th birthday, our city celebrates its 150th year. Today, we have Wichita State Vice Mayor Cindy Claycomb with us to celebrate and recognize the close ties we have to each other as we both embark on these unique times together. Prior to serving the city of Wichita, Dr. Claycomb held positions here at Wichita State as a professor of marketing, also the interim dean of the W. Frank Barton School of Business, and assistant to the president for strategic planning. Before that, she spent over a decade in analyst and management positions at two local Fortune 500 companies, Boeing and Pizza Hut, a division of PepsiCo. Please help me welcome to the podium our Vice Mayor, Cindy Claycomb.
Well, thank you, Dr. Muma. I really appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to start by saying congratulations to the faculty award winners. I know what it takes to win those awards, and I really want to thank those faculty for their dedication. You know, I have a long history with WSU, and it's truly an honor for me to be here today speaking at Convocation. I once sat in your seats. I have been a student, I've been on faculty, and I've been an administrator at Wichita State University, and I have great memories from all my time, in particular, the relationships that I have formed with students. Some of those friendships still continue today. So we come here today to celebrate the strong tie between our community and Wichita State University. 2020 is the 150th birthday for our city and our county, as well as the 100th in so many ways for our community. Unfortunately, celebrating these milestones looks much different this year than we had planned. Uh, the pandemic and economic challenges have changed many things about 2020, including this ceremony. This year has challenged us all in different ways. We've watched our world rapidly change before our eyes. So today we celebrate the institution of higher learning and most especially its role in how our society will change. You are not here only because you want to learn more about the field of your future employment, but because you want to be challenged and educated to better interact with our world and affect change. So over the next year, think critically about your experience, your responsibility, and your challenges as a local and a global citizen. Think about the ways that you can change your community for the better, how you want our world to change. You are at a very unique place in history, one where the individual has more of a chance to be heard and shape our world than ever before. You have more information and connectivity at your fingertips than ever before in history. And with that comes the responsibility to be well-informed and to work to help make the world a better place with your knowledge and your privilege. So I want to challenge each of you to get involved locally. Volunteer for a cause which you care deeply about. Listen and engage with people who are different from you, with different cultural backgrounds, with different life experiences, with different opinions than yours. And learn to disagree with others with kindness and humility. Learn to stand up for others without the same privileges you have been given and dedicate yourself wholeheartedly to lifelong learning. After leaving academia to focus on serving Wichita on the city council, I found myself continuing to learn and grow. I learned how to run a campaign, I learned how to better engage with residents, and I've learned to shape policy for the advancement of our community. So this year, our community has faced challenges, challenges that I've never seen in my life in industry or academia. First, we started with the 737 MAX layoffs, which seems like a very long time ago. Uh, then the pandemic and its effect on our economy. And then civil unrest that has affected each of us. So these challenges and those to come provide an opportunity for you to be more innovative than ever. Personally, academically, I want to thank you for including me in this fifth annual convocation. I look forward to watching the progress and success of our student body, our faculty, and our staff as you continue to work to shape our city and community for the better. So make the most of your semester with these challenges, and thank you. This year, our student speaker will be the Student Government Association Vice President, Mackenzie Haas. Mackenzie is a senior pursuing a degree in communication with an emphasis in integrated marketing, along with a minor in English. 
She is a 63rd session student body vice president and has been working alongside our campus reintegration COVID-19 team throughout the summer and the fall to ensure a safe return to campus for shockers. On top of her work in the Student Government Association, McKenzie is involved in campus with public relations, Student Society, Society of America, the Shocker Vote Coalition, and Mortarboard Honor Society. Please help me in welcome McKenzie to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Muma, and good morning, Shockers. I'm very excited to be here with you for convocation today, even if it looks a little bit different in these unprecedented times. This year has been extremely eye-opening. We have had plenty of time to reflect on ourselves, institutions, and injustices. This year will be a defining moment in history, especially for us as young adults. We are at an intersection in our lives where we are passionate, driven, and dedicated to achieve whatever we set our minds to. The global pandemic and Black Lives Matter has highlighted issues within our healthcare infrastructure, our justice systems, and our social institutions. And as a young adult living through this time, we have a specific advantage to see the outcome of the work that we put in now. I personally want to look back and be able to say that our generation made the changes that we want to see. I have seen advocacy in all forms over the past six months, and I believe that this advocacy will follow us to the ballot boxes in November. We are powerful voices demanding to be heard. We have signed the petitions, written the emails, marched in the streets, and now the time has come for us to put that work into action and vote. There is much more work to be done. By voting, we're taking that first step forward. My challenge to each and every one of you is to allow your vote to be an act of allyship. Voting is the most democratic action we can take as American citizens. Our votes are not just for ourselves, but for our family, our friends, and our communities. Those with the privilege to vote must utilize it to elevate the voices of the voiceless. Now, more than ever, it is important that we bear in mind the causes we are fighting for when voting. I believe in a better future, and I know our generation believes in this too. However, we have to do our part to make a difference in this world, and that starts with voting. Not just voting this November, but every year, and not just for the general election, but at a state and local level as well. To find more information about your candidates, voting dates, and how to register to vote, visit ksvotes.org. This is also where you can request an absentee or mail-in ballot, which is a safe alternative way to vote during this pandemic. Additionally, the Shockers Vote Coalition will be hosting educational events throughout the upcoming weeks to begin preparing young voters for the elections this November. Keep up to date with panel and event dates, um, through their Facebook page, Shockers Vote WSU. Shockers, go out and vote because we are powerful voices that will be heard. It is now time to hear from our featured keynote speaker. We are very proud and excited to introduce the author of this year's common read book, Some Were Poppers, Some Were Kings, Dispatches from Kansas. Mark McCormick is Wichita's very own prize-winning journalist. He is a New York Times best-selling author, reporter, editor, and columnist. He is a proud recipient of over 20 industry and community awards, including five gold medals from the Kansas City Press Club, a first place award from Kansas Association, and a Man of the Year award from Wichita Business and Professional Women. Mark is the Director for Strategic Communications for the ACLU of Kansas. Previously, he was the Executive Director of the Kansas African American Museum in Wichita, and former executive board member of the Association of African American Museums. He also spent three years as Director of Communications at the Kansas Leadership Center. Please help me welcome Mark McCormick.
Thank you for that introduction. I mean, is it just me, or does this picture look like a before and after? Uh, <laughs> this is you as an activist, and then this is you after 30 years of activism. Um, <laughs> no, um, my message today is it has a lot of urgency, but I wanted to take a moment uh, to express some gratitude to a few people who are here. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the work of my cousin, Ricardo Harris, who works here uh, in this community. Um, he's one of the people that I admire most uh, for his strength, uh, for his integrity, for his sensitivity. Um, one of my good buddies, uh, it's more like a brother to me, Van Williams, is here today. He didn't just make me want to be a good dad. He wanted me to, I, I wanted to be a great dad like him. And I feel like his work in this community doesn't get the appreciation that it deserves. And I hope this community appreciates him before they lose him. Um, we can't afford to keep losing people like Van. And then I also wanted to recognize my good friend, Joe Rodriguez, who is here. Um, myself, Joe and Van, we used to work together at the Wichita Eagle. And uh, Joe was special because he has always been someone who picked at me uh, whenever he had the opportunity. If we were in an elevator, for example, at the courthouse, and the elevator's crowded, he would make the point to say, you know, in front of everybody, as I was getting off, uh, Mark, just because you're on probation, doesn't, you're off probation, doesn't mean that you can go out and do whatever you want to do. Um, and I've been away from Wichita for a couple of years now, but it appears that Joe has been telling people that I heard a news report that most traffic accidents take place within a mile of home, and that's why I really moved. So, um, But with that, I wanted to, to share uh, a couple of moments of gratitude before I get into my, uh, to my remarks. But one of my earliest school memories was a kindergarten classmate's dinner invitation. Adults around me seemed pleasantly stunned, fascinated, really. They discussed the invitation in eyebrow-raised whispers. It was the early 1970s. Schools had only recently dropped their long fight against integration, and the invitation came from a white West Side home to my African-American home here in Northeast Wichita. But all that mattered to Sharon Wasson, a Wichita State graduate, by the way, but all that mattered to her, my classmate's mother, was that Dana had invited me, her classmate, to a pint-sized version of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And that sort of thing just wasn't done then unless you were Mrs. Wasson. When Dana's older brother invited a black child to a sleepover and her mother's friends belched, you have a daughter, why would you allow a black boy to sleep over? Mrs. Wasson welcomed the boy. Interestingly, that boy that was invited over was Eric Sexton, who used to work here as Wichita State's athletic director. Mrs. Wasson represented the American values people so eagerly and proudly proclaim but so rarely live up to. We need a million Sharon Wassons, but we lost the one good one we had when she passed away at age 81. I'm a better adult because she smiled at me when I was a child. At a time when white society re recommended that she sneer at black children, she was busy hugging me and a lot of the other black children at OK Elementary. When I broke my leg at school, she carried me to the nurse's office. And during a school outing, she shot a photograph of me and one of my dear friends. It's a photograph that I will always cherish. We can all learn something from her beauty and from her compassion. And sometimes all we need is an invitation. And I'm so very thankful for this invitation. I never imagined that my columns and my work, years after I would produced them, would have this kind of shelf life or be embraced by one of our states um, most important institutions. This is a most humbling experience. I'd like to thank Mike Poge and Gretchen Ike and Laura Tillum and the Blue Cedar Press for seeing a book in this collection of columns and working so hard to get it published. I thought that I might have five good columns, but they saw 50 and worked to get this book done. I wrote those opening lines about Mrs. Wasson in October of 2017, and I remain sentimental about it and about her because she likely passed without knowing what all of her kindnesses meant to me. It's not lost on me that I've lived a pretty charmed life 
and I've benefited from the love and support of a lot of people, and no one accomplishes anything in this life alone. I was blessed to have Miss Alice Lewis as my English teacher at Hadley Junior High. She was only my second African-American teacher. Mrs. Scott, who lived right across Hillside on Maplewood, was my kindergarten teacher, but it was Mrs. Lewis who was the first person to tell me, you know, Mark, I think you could make a living as a writer, and her encouragement got me on this road that I'm on today. My high school counselor, Tommy Williams, and my high school journalism teacher, Gay Coburn, got me into a summer KU journalism camp following my junior year of high school that literally changed my life. And Vice Principal Terry Guidry kept me out of trouble so I could stay on that path. At KU, I met professors Sam Adams and Suzanne Shaw. They invited me into their lives, into their hearts. Suzanne would at me and wag her finger at me and hug me. Sat up late with me more than once to try and keep me from quitting school. And like a lot of dads do, lavished a lot of unearned and undeserved praise on me. I was blessed to have so many black male role models like Daddy Sam, Tommy Williams, Bugs Polite, Donnie Holloway, William Sanders, among others. I would not be here today without the loving guidance of Shakura Sintwali, who gave me a ton of books to read about my people, videos to watch, and the example of an unapologetic African who loves our people with abandon. I would also not be here today without Cheryl Miller, Sharika Fisher, and Tarima Musa, who made all of this happen. I think we should all give them a hand. I want to thank all of them and all of you here for this opportunity. I've appreciated all of my invitations, but this one is indeed special. Um, the spirit of my book, the spirit of my work when uh, I was writing columns was to try and promote a kind of common good and this morning, I'm going to present an idea that I hope promotes the common good. And from time to time, I feel like I was able to do that in my columns. Um, I can remember being at a Rotary uh, luncheon, and I was sitting next to Pete Armstrong, who was scolding me because something that I had written, uh, he felt like had ruined Wichita's chances at uh, getting a collection of Gordon Park's work. But when I explained to him that I thought Wichita State had a real shot at getting that collected, the collected works of Gordon Parks. Um, he called the university, and the next thing you know, uh, through the work of people like Ted Ayers and Terry Johnson, uh, that collection is here at Wichita State, and it's one of the finest collections of Gordon Parks' work outside of the Parks Foundation in New York City. So I'm going to share an idea with you this morning, and I hope you can all embrace it. In 1924, W.B. Du Bois said that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. I learned from the late great Egyptologist Asa Hilliard that Du Bois was no ordinary scholar. He was a definer of sociology, writing volume one of the Harvard monograph series on the subject. Nearly 100 years later, it appears that in many ways Du Bois was prescient. America is more than 240 years old and on this continent, enslaved Africans spent more than 240 years in slavery and roughly another 100 years living in government-sanctioned segregation. We live in a nation where in my parents' lifetime, it was illegal in some states for a black motorist to pass a white motorist in traffic. It was illegal for a black person and a white person to play checkers or chess on a sidewalk on a public street. It was illegal for a black person to use a white telephone booth I saw on a 2015 trip to Selma, Alabama, where an African-American church was actually forced to build a second front facade on a side street, complete with the columns and steep exterior steps, because white citizens there didn't want to be offended at the sight of black people coming in and out of the church's main entrance. This issue of structural racism continues to tear at the fabric of who we aspire to be. We can't continue to leave it untreated. So I'm here this morning with a recommendation. Wichita State should consider developing a degree program aimed at the study of structural racism and how to dismantle it. And when that school opens, it should be named for Ron Walters. And among the program's first group of students should be students from this very neighborhood whom the school should admit for free. 
a couple of times this last week, this issue has surfaced. The president has spoken out against using the 1619 project from the New York Times to teach this history. I think we ought to do the opposite. I think we need to lean into this history. I'm sharing this here because we need the energy and the impatience of youth behind this movement. We need you. We need you students. In the 1960s and 70s, black students clamored for black studies and African American studies programs. They wanted to learn more about what had been hidden from them. Black people were wearing their hair naturally, um, embracing Africa and craving cultural kinship. This program would be a part of that continuum, but this time it would include everyone. Race and racism are studied now in various disciplines, economics, sociology, psychology, history, anthropology. At UCLA Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health, they have a multidisciplinary collaborative research center housed at the Department of Community Health Sciences. It is a public health program that targets racism as a public health issue. At the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, they offer an anti-racist academic program related to systemic racism and anti-racism. All current students there take a non-credit bearing mandatory course on systemic racism. The University of North Carolina Charlotte offers a graduate certificate in anti-racism in its urban education school. What I have not seen, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but what I have not seen was a degree program on this subject. I'm talking about figuring out a way to bring multiple disciplines together in a major, in a minor, or even temporarily in an area of emphasis using your badges program here that explores structural racism with the explicit purpose of dismantling it. In this society, what gets measured gets done, and this should be our next measurement. Neely Fuller said it best, if you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, how it works, everything else will only confuse you. And make no mistake, structural racism is difficult to understand unless you have the proper context for its absurdities, for its complicity, and for its narcissism. Jo Brown was the first black woman to serve as president of the Wichita School Board. She visited North High when I was a student there in the 1980s, and she shared a story that I had never heard before, but one that I'll never forget. She explained that at my beloved high school, there was a time when black students could only use the swimming pool on Fridays so that the pool could be drained and cleaned and refilled so that the white students didn't have to swim in the same water. And years later, as a columnist at the Eagle, I wrote about this, and some Eagle readers com came completely unglued. The letters poured in, as did calls to opinion line. I was being pressured to write a correction, but I dug in my heels and braced for the worst, for the worst. But that's when my hero, Joe, called me, and she said, they're really after you now, huh, baby? She seemed to be giggling on the phone. I could hear a cool confidence in her voice. She said, here's what we're gonna do. You go down to the Central Branch Public Library, and you ask for the book about the history of the Wichita School District, written by Sandra Van Meter. The book was a historical account of the district. She commissioned the writing of the book as board president, and there in those pages was a description that was to me even worse than what she had described at North High School all those years before. City officials had actually considered building a separate high school just to accommodate a separate pool. And it was the expense, not the stupidity of the idea, that scuttled that proposal. So, I wrote my rebuttal column, the angry voices faded, and I survived that round. But I'll never forget those vehement denials. The people writing and calling could not imagine behavior so grotesque. It was so horrible in their minds, it couldn't possibly be true. And because they had the power to declare it so, they tried to do just that. But they had not counted on Joe actually documenting the history. Otherwise, they would have succeeded in hiding the history, which sadly has become a tradition in this nation. So all these years later, I'm reading Isabel Wilkerson's new book, Cast, and guess what popped up on the pages? A story about Newton, Kansas, its municipal swimming pool, and a lawsuit in which the city of Newton offered a similar argument about keeping impure people out of the water. The ordeal at that column was terrifying. And it was terrifying because I knew I was right. My mother was a 1945 graduate 
of North High School. And when I asked her about this, she said she remembered it. And if you know anything about segregation in this country, there's also, there has always been this particular queasiness among white communities about sharing swimming spaces, about sharing swimming pools. But because people were unfamiliar with this history or didn't want to have it told, I could have lost everything because I shared that story. That's the kind of financial and psychological terror black Americans manage daily in this country on top of the physical vulnerability that attends any interface with law enforcement. Our society is so unforgiving when it comes to blackness. Our very presence, it seems, is a provocation. We've been rendered invisible in many ways, and sometimes we sought invisibility for our own protection. I remember hearing Dick Gregory talk about this. I remember him talking about how the black church used to offer the only place where black people could be seen as whole human beings. He said there was a time, for example, that if a black man bought a nice new car, he'd have to park it several blocks away and walk to work because if his white boss saw it, they might fire him for being uppity. But he could drive that car to church. He said a black man couldn't wear his best clothes to work for the same reason, but he could wear them to church. I see now that when I was little, why it was so important to wear a suit to school. He couldn't tell his white coworkers that his kids went to Princeton. But at church, the pastor would smile and say, our brother's babies are graduating, and everybody would cheer. And when Miss Bessie died, the white newspaper wouldn't post her obit, but the community that loved her could read about it in the church bulletin and then take food to her family's home. These aren't simply individual acts of cruelty, though they are cruel and they do seem to begin with individuals. I'm talking about a system. And that past terror in many ways remains our current terror. My father explained to me a long time ago that our family had to flee Alabama in the late 1800s. His grandfather, my great grandfather, had seen a lynching and thought, I have to get my family out of here. Lynchings I'd learned from my own study were orchestrated rituals of terror, staged for maximum impact. Even when complete, the families and friends and neighbors of the victims were prohibited from rem removing the mutilated bodies. And I say mutilated because sometimes ears, teeth, and fingers were collected as souvenirs. Local authority ordered that the body stand as a temporary monument to the powerful social order. This exhibition was more important than the lynching itself. Photos were taken. Schools released children early so they could join their parents at these events. People sat and ate sandwiches while the victims were hung and sometimes burned. Others produced postcards of these macabre scenes. Implicit also in this is the demonstration of power and trying to convince the people being terrorized that there was absolutely nothing that they could do. Compare this with the systems at work today, the temerity, and the impunity feel historically similar. I could remember when the video of Los Angeles police beating Rodney King surfaced in the early 1990s. I was thinking that finally, police officers who mercilessly beat someone would be held to account, but they all walked. And I think we need to prepare ourselves for the likelihood that the officers who killed Breonna Taylor in her bed will walk. We need to prepare ourselves for the likelihood that the men who considered themselves law enforcement and killed Ahmad Arbery will walk. We need to prepare ourselves for the likelihood that the officers who killed George Floyd will walk, particularly if the defense is granted the change of venue that it's seeking. The terrors of our past have proven more durable than we could have ever imagined. And I have said for years that systems produce the results that they were designed to produce. Our system is not broken. As Wichita State University's own Dr. Michael Berzer has demonstrated in his research, police continue to stop black people in percentages out of proportion to their presence in the population. We also know that black people remain in pretrial detention longer because they tend to not have as much money, so they can't afford bail, which means that they aren't out hiring a lawyer and building a defense, which means that they're more likely to be convicted. Prosecutors routinely strike black jurors from jury pools. Almost none of our public defenders or their offices enjoy pay or resource, resource equity and parity with prosecutors. 
black youth find themselves under surveillance by police and schools and end up racking up the kinds of juvenile records that lead to presumptive prison for first infraction as an adult. Is it any wonder our prisons are so full? But this terror exists beyond the criminal justice system too. There are monuments to this terror standing in people's yards in this community. The monstrous electrical towers destroying decades of homeowner investment and black wealth. I don't think Gail is here today, but we ought to applaud Gail Finney's work at getting those poles removed. We need to start this new degree program and encourage more neutral and inclusive history in our public schools and in our textbooks. Perhaps those books could be published here at Wichita State under the auspices of this new program. So much of what ails us is born out of willful ignorance, but I'm still naive enough to believe that if more, under, if more people understood the history of this nation, if they got just a whiff of what it was like to exist as an African American in this society, they wouldn't want anyone else to experience it. This isn't the case with everyone, and certainly not with a hardened 25% of the population eager to defend or explain away even explicitly racist behavior. But if we can get the truth in front of enough of our friends and neighbors, we could actually operate like a society that has shared values. Now this might bother some of you, but to this end, we really ought to stop asking for the Confederate monuments to come down. Leave them up as the monuments to shame that they are. Do not rename the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma after John Lewis. Leave it named after the racist it was named after. Leave the Confederate flag flying wherever it is flying. Let's not hide this history anymore. Let's not hide this behavior anymore. Let's shine a light on it. Let's give it context and most important, let's study it. Let's add William T. Thompson's quote to the Confederate memorials and any plaza where the Confederate flag flies. He designed the flag and said, quote, as a people, we are fighting to maintain the heaven-ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior colored race, unquote. Let's add an excerpt from Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech. Stevens was vice president of the Confederacy and said, quote, our new government's foundations are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, unquote. There's nothing ambiguous about that. We don't study any of this enough. And until we do, we'll never be able to work through these structural issues that we have. But Wichita State should consider this. This city needs it and our society needs it. Race was and remains an organizing principle in this society. It's in our founding documents and it's borne out in stark documentary detail in books like The Color of Law and When Affirmative Action Was White. I'm now sitting on the governor's to one of the greatest commissions ever assembled, the Kerner Commission, formed in 1967. A Smithsonian Magazine story from March of 2018 about the 1968 Kerner Commission report said that it found that poverty and institutional racism were driving inner city violence. This is from the story. Bad policing practices, a flawed justice system, unscrupulous consumer credit practices, poor or not inadequate housing, high unemployment, voter suppression, and other culturally embedded forms of racial discrimination all converged to propel violent upheaval on the streets of American neighborhoods. White society, it said, is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. It was 50 years ago. Now, as edgy as this sentiment might seem, this idea is actually going mainstream. Brian Stevenson, who stood here a year or so ago, has famously said that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Jane Elliott was doing her blue eyes, brown eyes classroom experiment 50 years ago. And the takeaway wasn't simply that nice, caring people could be turned into nasty little bigots in a matter of minutes. What frightened Jane Elliott was how the children in the outgroup, the ones who'd endured a single day as the lower caste, performed more poorly on their tests that day. If a few hours could do that to a child, she asked in horror, what would a lifetime of that do to a person? People know this and they've known it for years. In Wilkerson's book, she said, 
a white students won an essay contest in the 1940s about what to do with Hitler after the war. She won with one powerful and telling sentence, quote, put Hitler in black skin and make him live here in America, unquote. It's not insignificant either that Wilkerson also says in her book that the Nazis studied our racial caste system and found it too harsh. Our racial caste system impacts other races as well. This has happened to American Indians in this country. Children were ripped away from their families and had their sacred braids shorn off in schools designed to civilize them. And it seems today that we're all fine with little brown babies being locked in cages on the border. Since 1919, the summer of racial riots that began at a Chicago beach because a black child had waded into the white portion of the beach water, it's always about swimming. We've had some sort of major clash nearly every decade, all the way up to Ferguson and Baltimore a few years ago, to Minneapolis and Portland today. Consider Dr. King's words in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? King argued that systemic racism stood in the way of America's democracy. I'm quoting him here. Negroes have proceeded from the premise that equality means what it says, and they have taken white Americans at their word when they talk of it as an objective. But most whites in America, Dr. King said, proceed from a premise that equality is simply a loose expression for improvement. White America is not even psychologically organized to close this gap. Essentially, the country seeks only to make it less painful, less obvious, but in most respects, to retain it. And again, that wasn't Malcolm X, that was Dr. King. And 50 years later, retain it, this country has. One of the more interesting concepts that I've run across to explain this phenomena is opportunity hoarding. A business professor at Rutgers named Nancy D. Tommaso coined this term to explain that the inequality we see is not racism, but rather in-group favoritism. White people are not discriminating, she says. They are favoring people in their in-group, and the results could be mistaken with systemic racism. I still see a tacit admission there about systemic inequality, and I also think we need to continue to study it. But think about what that opportunity hoarding does to people who lack those opportunities. Many of those people, many of those talented people, have to leave this community and take their talents elsewhere and work to build communities elsewhere. So when you systemically create landscapes of scarcity, you turn people against each other. People simply trying to survive turn into competitors. They can become petty, mean, vindictive, and jealous, and that's not who we are as a culture. What develops, as E. Franklin Frazier wrote decades ago, is the development of a petty black bourgeoisie that will often find itself at odds with general black progress, and they're invested in maintaining the status quo and their elevated position in it. They become the leadership white authority recognizes, the people rewarded with the limited opportunities available. These divisions make it difficult for a community to defend itself against things like urban renewal, which is code for Negro removal. And it happened on the very block where TCAM stands today. It happened when in the name of progress, Interstate 135 was rammed right down the middle of this very community, as it did in many black communities across this country. And it's happening again with these power poles. Friends, we have to, we have to study this system. We have to study the system that declared decades ago that while no new schools would be built in the black community, the tax dollars of black homeowners in black communities would help fund the construction of new schools elsewhere in town. We need to study the system that made the 1965 tanker crash that killed my grandmother and other family members more deadly because of segregated housing patterns. You need only read D.W. Carter's book, Mayday Over Wichita, if you do not believe me. Again, I just come up with these ideas, but imagine students double majoring or graduating with a degree in business and a minor in structural racism. They would be poised to take on the work of rebuilding urban areas that had been gerrymandered out of economic opportunity. Imagine students graduating with nursing degrees with an emphasis on structural racism and then working to address the myriad health disparities in black communities, including why the, the zip code I grew up in, 67214, has one of the nation's highest black infant mortality rates. 
Imagine students graduating with psychology, sociology, or even journalism degrees with a structural racism minor or major. They'd make our country a better place. And it should be here at Wichita State. It should be us. It should be here in this town. World War II's Double V campaign started here in Wichita. Lawyer Donald Hollowell, who represented Martin Luther King, Julian Bond, John Lewis, was born here, but is known in Dr. King's hometown as Mr. Civil Rights. The first successful student-led sit-in occurred here in Wichita. It is the home of one of the greatest political strategists of the past century, Ronald Walters, whom I had mentioned the school should be named for. This is a man who's one of the architects of the Congressional Black Caucus. He addressed the French Senate. He was a campaign manager for the Reverend Jesse Jackson's two presidential campaigns, and he was one of the masterminds behind the Dockham sit-in protest. Wichita State hired coach Willie Jefferson, the first black Division I football coach, the editor of ESPN's The Undefeated, which examines the nexus of race, culture, and sports, is a black man from Wichita named Kevin Merida. Can you imagine having Kevin Merida as an adjunct professor or a faculty member here? The head of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture is a black man who grew up in Topeka named Kevin Young. Can you imagine what we could do with that partnership? We can do it here because Pizza Hut and Renna Center and Phillips 66 and White Castle all started here because Wichita is about innovation. Wichita State has become a giant in some areas, but it's also been a giant killer. I'll remind you that Wichita State beat out the Smithsonian and the New York City Public Library for Gordon Park's collected works. Somehow I think that if Goliath had seen Wushok coming over those Galilean hills instead of David, he might have gone the other way. A program like this would pull students from everywhere, black students in particular. And I have to tell you, this is an appealing idea to me. I might have to come out of retirement and go back to school. Um, but I want to leave you with this. The problem of the next 100 years doesn't have to be the color line. We have everything we need to write our own end to this ugly chapter of American history, as well as a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and insightful keynote this morning, Mr. McCormick. Um, I believe that privilege is the ability to look away, and I really, I hope, I pray that our university does not look away and that this idea is seriously considered because I would love to have you back as a shocker. Um, today we are excited to be joined by our current student, John Kirk, who will be leading us in one of our favorite traditions of this program, singing the alma mater. You can find the words on the screen on the stage, and at the conclusion of the program, you are welcome to join us for a reception and book signing in the ADA area at the back of the auditorium. Please stand and join me in welcoming John Kirk to the podium to sing, to lead us in the alma mater. Wichita stands proudly on the hill. Our sons and daughters bow to thee, our hearts with praise we fill. Then hail our alma mater, hail thee grand and true. Long wave the yellow and the black, O oh, Wichita, here's to you.
Thank you for joining us for today's program. Oh, you may all sit, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you for joining us for today's program. I would like to extend a thank you to the Office of Student Success, Tarima, Sharika, and Kim, um, and the student involvement team who worked hard to make convocation a safe tradition for us to continue to celebrate today. Also, thank you to our speakers today. It was honored, an honor to have Vice Mayor Cindy Claycomb and our guest speaker, Mark McCormick. Mr. McCormick, your advocacy within journalism is admirable on many levels, and I hope you know you have made a great impact on Wichita. Election season is upon us, and I urge you all to seek out information on candidates and how to register to vote. The Shockers Vote Coalition will continue throughout the year and hosting events throughout the year, including a panel on diversity and po local politics next Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Follow the Shockers Vote Coalition on Facebook at Shockers Vote WSU for additional information. Get out and vote in November, but continue to be engaged in action year-round in local and state elections. Um, we will be exiting stage right to the doors at the back. Um, right for you guys, left for me. Remember to stay civically engaged and have a great year, Shockers. Go Shocks.